All righty, good morning, gang. Welcome back. Uh, give me just one second here and we'll get started. Crazy what's going on in Texas right now. I um, cannot imagine. I haven't spent a lot of time there, but I've certainly flown through Dallas Fort Worth a bunch of times. Uh, not a place you would expect to ever freeze. Does anybody know anyone who's out there? <clears throat> All right, well, let's get back to talking about mathematics. Um, I've graded most of the exams. So uh, if yours hasn't been graded yet, I'm sorry. I worked last night until um, 9, 9.30, something like that, and then I hung it up. Um, so if your exam hasn't been graded yet, it will be graded today. Uh, that's, that's always my promise. I'll get it to you within a week. Um, yeah, I apologize if yours hasn't been graded before class today. I really did want to have that done, but sometimes there just isn't time. So, um, there are some things I want to talk about. Let's say the 17th. hasn't been But um, the things I, I kind of wanted to talk about some stuff from the test, not not like specific problem solving things. So I make lots and lots of comments on the test. Um, and hopefully from my comments, you can go in and solve any problems that you either didn't solve or got wrong. Um, if there are particular problems you want to see work, then I'm happy to do those. Um, that's the sort of thing that office hours are really best for. So if you want to come by office hours and see solutions to some problems from the test, I'm happy to do it. Just come by office hours. Um, <clears throat> But my intention is for you guys to look at the comments I make and then figure out where you went wrong and finish them from there. There are a few things though that I wanted to talk about kind of to the group as a whole. Um, because I haven't finished grading, I haven't looked at any statistics yet. But there are definitely some trends that I've noticed. Um, so this is where I'm gonna be a little mean. Uh, God damn it, you guys, you need to know your unit circle. Um, and while we're here, the definition of the trig functions. I know that trigonometry at Santa Fe is sometimes a little bit weak. Um, I've taught trig here, so I'm familiar with the trig curriculum here. I also have watched many people teach trig here, and uh, I have a good feel for kind of how hard, how easy it usually is, and I know it's usually way too easy. Um, but this is calculus. And the reason we teach trigonometry is because you need that shit here. And it's not like some fun like aside. Um, it's fucking necessary. So if you had a a soft trig class. If you had a trig class that didn't push you hard enough, that's not your fault. But it is your responsibility to make up for it. It's your responsibility to know the material that you need to know uh, at this point. 
Um, if that's because your trig teacher didn't present it to you, then I'm, I'm especially sorry. That, that really sucks. But if it's because your teacher presented it to you but then didn't like hold you accountable for it, then that's definitely on you. In any case, I'm, I'm here to help. If there's a place where you have some deficits um, when it comes to trigonometry, if you're looking for tricks to remember the unit circle, or if you want practice problems or anything like that, come to me. I'll help you. Please um, do it. <clears throat> But you got to know this stuff. You got to know the unit circle. You got to know the definition of the trig functions. There's no way around it. Um, the limit definition of the derivative. I think I said a few times um, that this was going to be on the test, right? Like there will be problems where you have to calculate the derivative as a limit. Um, that's this one. So it's, it's no secret that there's going to be a problem like this on the test. Um, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of folks um, didn't try even write this down. And uh, you know, this is, uh, this is important. You need to know this. This is, this is where our intuition and our geometric understanding for what the derivative is comes from. It's this idea of you take you know, a slope of a secant line and you bring the two points closer together. H is the distance between the two points. Um, and so as you bring the two points on a secant line close together, you get a tangent line. So this, this really is important. It's not just like an exercise in futility. Um, you got to know this. And if a problem says to calculate a derivative using the limit definition, then this is what you got to do. Um, so I know a, a handful of people saw that problem and were like, uh, either didn't remember the limit definition of the derivative or like, fuck it, this is going to take too long, and used some combination of other things. You could have used the quotient rule on that, although you didn't need to. A lot of people did. Um, you can use the power rule on that one. A lot of people did. Um, but I can't give you credit unless you follow the directions, right? The whole point of that problem was to um, was to, to test your ability to work with this definition, because this is a really important definition. Um, so the correct answer isn't, isn't worth that much without the work backing it up. And that's the kind of last thing I wanted to say. I thought you must show your work. Um, on the free response. Um, and don't be like nervous or afraid of what work you show or anything like that. Literally, when I say show your work, I mean, I want to see what you wrote during the test. Nothing else, nothing less. So please don't throw away anything that you wrote during the test. Um, and please don't add anything after the fact. I don't want to see like a recopied collection of your work from the test. I don't want to see like something that you've, you've polished up. And, um, and I certainly don't want you to omit anything. Uh, so please just show me everything that, that you write down during the test. The intent is for the work that you scan to be it, it literally just like the work that I would collect during a, an actual written test in class. Um, so the biggest thing here, I think, was, was probably the trig stuff, right? You got to know your trig. Really got to know your trig. Startling number of people didn't know the derivative of tangent or that the tangent of pi over 6 is 1 over the square root of 3. Those sort of things. And those hurt, um, of course, because there are a couple problems on the test that refer to trig functions, and you, you simply must know them. Um, and then the problem that involved the limit definition, please uh, make sure you're comfy with this. I tried to warn us about it a lot, but um, you, you need to know this and you need to be comfortable working with it. Um, and then when it comes to showing work on the free response, yeah, show all your work. Don't throw anything out. Don't recopy it neatly. Um, as, long as, as long as you can read it, I promise you, I can read it too. I've been doing this for a long time. I read all sorts of bad handwriting, um, my own included. <clears throat> so don't be shy. Um, just show me exactly what you did during the test. That's all I want. Okay. Um, after I finish, also I'll have the tests graded um, by the end of the day today, and then I'll run some statistics. And next time we talk, we can talk about the, the stats and scores on the test. But I, I feel like it's about where I would expect. Um, if you have particular questions about your test, come see me in office hours. All right. Um, other stuff that's going on today. What else are we doing today? Today we are going to continue working with implicit differentiation. Uh, 
Um, specifically, we're going to look into what are called related rates. And this is um, so 3.9, I think. <clears throat> yeah, 3.9. So um, the key to related rates is being good with implicit differentiation and you know comfortable with the chain rule. Um, so I want to sort of introduce this stuff gently. And I want to make sure we're, we're genuinely comfortable. Uh, now, it's uh, maybe one more thing about exam one before I wander away too far. Um, you need to be putting in time. Uh, this is certainly not true of everyone, but there are a handful of, of papers that I graded there where it was just clear that like you hadn't really solved the problems on your own, um, hadn't been working the homework till you understand it. Um, this class is a little bit different than previous math classes in the sense that, well, while I am here to help you, um, I'm not here to like hold your hand all the way. You know, I can, I can kind of bring you to the water and show you like this is the good spot to drink, but then you have to do the drinking. Um, so it, it's a, a serious time commitment that you need to make um, every week, really every day, if you want to be good at this stuff. Uh, you need to be putting in two, three hours. Um, every day if you want to be good. Uh, if you want to like make it through, the at bat, absolute bare minimum is three hours a week. Um, but really, you should be putting like at least an hour or two every day, probably closer to three hours every day. Um, solving problems, right? Getting in there, solving the problems by yourself. You don't want outside assistance. You don't want to be leaning too much on outside resources, because then you can kind of trick yourself into thinking you know the material when you don't. Um, so make sure that, you know, as you're practicing this stuff, like the study guides all look wonderful. The study guides all look perfect. Um, and that's a little weird because the tests don't all look perfect. Um, it's okay to have an imperfect study guide. That's actually the whole point. So I want to see your mistakes on the study guide. I want you to do those study guide problems kind of like you would do a test problem so I can give you feedback that will be useful to you on the test. So make sure you're putting in sufficient time. Make sure you're spending hours, several hours every week working on this stuff, like minimum three hours a week, preferably like two to three hours a day working on this stuff, working on it independently without asking for too much help. It's okay to ask for help, but then if you ask for help on something, you need to go back and work it independently. Um, and certainly not using any sort of things like Photomath or Symbolab or whatever. Um, that's the, the only way to prepare yourself for the tests. Um, and some, in some cases, it's pretty clear that that wasn't happening. And I just really want to encourage you guys and let you know, if you do that shit, if you spend the time and you work on these things independently by yourself until you get them, the tests will go great. You'll do really good on the test. There are plenty of people who did really good on this test. Um, and you can, you can have that too. Uh, the trick is to just put in the time. And the, the bare minimum is three hours a week. Ideally, we're talking about two to three hours a day. Um, but that's... That's where we're at. OK, um, so let's come back in here and let's talk about implicit differentiation a little bit more and see if we can't get, get a little closer to um, solving these related rates problems, which are a lot of fun. Um, <clears throat> imagine, that instead of assuming y to be a function of x, that we assumed y and x to both be functions of a third variable I'll call it t usually representing time 
what would implicit differentiation look like then? So if I wanted to differentiate with respect to t, the variable y, if y is a function of t, then this would give me dy dt. Right, because the, the variable I'm working with here is t. And the thing I want to differentiate is y. So if I take the derivative of y with respect to the variable t, the result is the derivative of y taken with respect to the variable t, dy dt. There's a notation for this that's used in physics. It's a y with a dot over the top. And similarly, d dt of x would be dx dt. And the notation for this is an x with a dot. I'll use the Leibniz notation as we're getting started. But then once we're getting a little more comfortable, I might switch to the dot notation. Think of the dot notation as like the prime notation. It really means the same thing. And you can have two dots for the second derivative, three dots for the third derivative, and so on. So why would this be an interesting or worthwhile thing to do? Well, because sometimes that is the case. Imagine a particle moving around the unit circle. Here, the unit circle, and I have on it a particle, and it's like, Wee, I'm going. And he just wants to fly around. His position on the unit circle is given by the normal coordinates x, comma, y. But maybe I imagine that he's got a little motor back here, like a little rocket motor pushing him in the y direction, and a little rocket motor over here pushing him in the x direction. And those two little motors have to function independently. Or maybe I'm just interested in how fast the x position is changing. I don't really care about the y. I just want to know how fast is he going back and forth along this as he spins around. The unit circle's equation is y squared plus x squared equals 1. And we can differentiate through this with respect to time. So if I wanted the velocity in just the x or y directions, then I'd be looking for dx dt or dy dt. Like in all of our particle problems so far, we've said there's a particle moving along a straight track. What if the track isn't straight? What if the particle is like this, going around on a circle? Well, then the velocity in the x direction, like how fast is this thing moving back and forth, that's dx dt, the change in the x position 
over time. And how fast is the particle moving up and down? How fast is it moving just in the y direction? That's dy dt, right? The change in y over the change in time. So if I take the equation of the unit circle and I differentiate on both sides with respect to time, that would look like this. And each of these little pieces can be calculated in terms of these little derivatives using implicit differentiation and the chain rule. If I differentiate y squared, this would be, I'll break it down real careful. So this is d dt of y squared plus d dt of x squared equals d dt of one. Um, yeah, directions, yep. If I wanted the velocity in just the x or y directions, then I'd be looking for dx dt or dy dt. Yeah, thank you, Trevor. So here and here, I need to differentiate implicitly. In our previous implicit differentiation work, we'd had a like a ddx of x squared, and we said that was just 2x. Well, now in both of these cases, we're differentiating implicitly with respect to some other variable. So the y squared is going to be 2y times dy dt. And the ddt derivative of x squared is going to be 2x times dx dt. And ddt of 1 is 0. Can and you this explain? Is a little bit more of like why it wouldn't just be 2x like last week or yes, Monday. So it's all about the variable we're differentiating with respect to, right? Last, last times we talked about implicit differentiation, we were differentiating with respect to x. So that was the discussion on the previous page here. x normally is what we think of as the independent variable. And when we first started talking about implicit differentiation, we said we're going to assume that y is a function of x. And that's what led us to the chain rule dy dt or dy dx stuff um, that we were doing on Monday. Here, instead of assuming y to be a function of x, instead of that, I'm going to assume that y and x are both functions of some third variable t. And then I'm going to take the derivative with respect to t. So instead of saying, okay, y is a function of x and x is the independent variable, I'm going to say both y and x are independent of each other and depend on this third variable t. So like x does its own thing and its variable is t, y does its own thing and its variable is t. They're not connected to each other, but they're both functions of time. So because the independent variable here is time, t, rather than x, when I take the derivative here, I'm differentiating with respect to t, not with respect to x. This says take the derivative of what's next to me, thinking of the variable as t. Well, x is not t, but the implicit assumption is that x is a function of t. So we need to treat the x's here just like we treated the y's in the previous section. Right, where we assumed y was a function of x and then applied the chain rule and got stuff that looked kind of like this. Now both x and y are like that and the variable is t. So just like when you differentiated the y squared on the 3.4 homework and you got like 2y dy dx, now we're differentiating with respect to t. So we get 2y dy dt. And the x here gets the same treatment because he's not. this isn't a ddx. This is a ddt, and this variable in here is not t. This is an x. So x is itself a function of time. 
And then if whatever we wanted to do from here, we could, right? If I wanted to know how fast is the thing moving in the X direction, I would solve for this. If I want to know how fast is the thing moving in the Y direction, I would solve for this. The basic idea, and maybe I can, from here, I can help with Mackenzie's question a little bit more, is that we are thinking, like Y is equal to F of T and X is equal to G of T. So things like DDT of X cubed, this is really like DDT of G of T cubed, right? And this is a chain rule thing. How would we differentiate this? Well, now I'm taking the T derivative of a function that only depends on T, but there's this inner and outer thing. So this would be three times G of T squared. There's the derivative of the outer leaving the inner alone times G primed of T. And what is that? Well, if X, if X is G of T, then three times G of T squared is three X squared. And G primed of T, if X is G of T, that would be DX DT. Right? Or if I wanted to take the DDT time derivative of, um, I don't know what we want to do here, like uh, cosine of Y, this would be like the DDT time derivative of the cosine of F of T. So again, it's a chain rule thing. We differentiate the outer, leaving the inner alone. That would give me negative sine of f of t. But then by the chain rule, you have to multiply by the derivative of the inner, which would be f primed of t. So this would be negative sine of y times dy dt. This is sort of what's going on, right? We're thinking of y as a function of time and x as a function of time, not directly connected to each other, each independent of each other, but both dependent on t. So when you take the derivative of something like this, the ddt, the time derivative of x cubed, you get 3x squared times dx dt. It really is just the chain rule. The trick is you have to pay attention to the thing downstairs here in the differential operator. Remember when I said that the Leibniz notation was good for some things, that we needed it for some things? This is that thing to make clear what you're differentiating with respect to, to make clear what the derivative considers the variable to be. So here the assumption is that x is a function of time. I say x equals g of t for some function g. Then the derivative d dt of x cubed, I'm just going to replace this x by g of t. Right? That's in this first line, the only thing I've done here, this x is g of t. So x cubed is g of t all cubed. If I take the derivative d dt, of g of t all cubed, this is the sort of shit that we saw back when we first learned about the chain rule. Oh no, yeah, sorry, sorry, this is a g. I'm so sorry. Yeah, so this is the sort of stuff we learned back when we were talking about the chain rule. So this is just a regular chain rule derivative now. This is something we could have done right away as soon as we learned the chain rule. We differentiate the outer function, which is this cubing function, right? If I sort of cover this up, this is like a something cubed. So it's going to differentiate to three times something squared. But then by the chain rule, we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. And then I just go back to rewriting this in terms of the variable x. Three times g of t squared is 3x squared, because x is g of t. And g primed of t, the derivative of g taken with respect to its variable, is dx dt, because again, x is g of t. So kind of the idea is we want to go straight from here to here. We want to be comfy going straight from the left end here to the right end here without writing any of the shit in between. And it's not that hard if you pay attention to what's going on, right? The derivative of cos y would normally be negative sine y. 
if I was differentiating with respect to y. But I'm differentiating with respect to the variable t. So according to the chain rule, I have to slap on a dy dt. So you just sort of take your normal derivative, right? Like you differentiate the outer function, leaving the inner function alone. You take the normal derivative of cosine, you get negative sine. Leave the inside alone and then multiply by the derivative of the inside. In this case, the derivative of the inside is the derivative of y, but it's being taken with respect to t. So instead of having, if this was d dy, this piece would be dy dy, it's one. If this was d dx, this would be dy dx or y primed. That would be kind of the normal chain rule implicit differentiation thing. But since this is a d dt, what we multiply by here, the derivative we multiply here according to the chain rule is dy dt. Um, so I hope this makes this feel a little more comfy, right? Looking at these, these sort of uh, very explicit examples. The place this stuff becomes very useful is when you have a physics situation where the geometry of the of the environment allows you to relate two variables, each of which are changing over time. So let me show you what I mean. I have here a circle. And it's full of goop. This is an oil spill. an oil spill in the ocean is growing. Um, we know, we know how much oil is being like spilled, right? Like the company Exxon Mobil or whoever knows how much shit is leaking out. We know that the area of the spill is increasing at the rate of, well, let's say, two square kilometers per day. Can we ask how fast? is the radius growing at the moment when the um, area is five kilometers squared. So this is an oil spill out there in the ocean, because we know how much stuff there is coming out, we can say how fast the area is growing, right? Because it's like, whatever, it's so thick, we know that it's only going to pile up like a micrometer or two. Um, so we can calculate based on the volume of the stuff coming out, the area of the spill, or at least how fast the area of the spill is changing, how much stuff is coming out. The question is, can you relate the area of this circle to its radius? And then can you relate the derivative of the area, how fast the area is growing, to the derivative of the radius? To do this, we have to begin with the area formula for the circle, right? You know that the area of a circle is pi times the radius squared. We know a few things. I know that the area is increasing at two kilometers squared per day. So we know that dA dt is two. We want how fast is the radius growing? So we want the r dt 
at the moment when the area is equal to five. So kind of, we always start with some sort of geometry formula. You want to write down what you know, what bit of information is given to you by the problem, and you want to write down what you want. This gives you something to shoot for. Now take a look at the things we know. We know dA dt, and we want dr dt. These are both time derivatives. So we should take this expression differentiating one with respect to t gives us, I'll have d dt of a equals d dt of pi r squared. Remember pi is a constant, so this pi can just pop out the derivative of a taken with respect to time, this is just dA dt. And over here, the pi, like I said, can pop out because he's a constant multiple. We'll have pi times the derivative of r. Well, I'll write it like this, the d dt derivative of r squared. So what we get is dA dt equals pi times the derivative of r squared taken with respect to t. So that's 2r, that's the derivative of the outer, and then I need to multiply by the derivative of the inner, which is dr dt. Does this make sense? Take a second, make sure you get this down clearly and correctly, and then ask any questions you have about where these derivatives are coming from. So I've got this DDT, right? I'm differentiating R squared with respect to time. This is a lot like this is a lot like this. If I differentiate x cubed with respect to time, I get 3x squared, my normal sort of derivative, and then I have to multiply by dx dt. Following the same sort of rules, if I differentiate r squared with respect to time, I get 2r, the normal outer derivative, times dr dt. It's the chain rule. R is a function of time, right? The radius of the circle, the circle is growing, which means the radius is changing over time. So the radius really is a function of time. So when you go to differentiate this, since we're taking the derivative with respect to the variable t, we need to multiply by the derivative of the inner function at the end. The outer function here is the squaring function. When you differentiate R squared, if you are taking the derivative with respect to r, you would just get 2r. When you differentiate the inner piece, just r, if you differentiate r with respect to t, you get dr dt. So it really is the chain rule. That's really what's going on here. Um, but it's implicit differentiation using the chain rule, right? We're differentiating implicitly with respect to the variable t. All right. So now what I have to do is look back up here at the stuff that I know and see if I can get out the stuff that I want. So dA dt, I know that that's two. So I get two equals pi times two r times dr dt. I'll write that as two pi r dr dt. What I'm after is dr dt. And this should be a number, right? I want to know at this particular moment, how fast is the radius growing? So it should be like, 
one kilometer per day or seven kilometers per day, something like that. I need to figure out what R is at the moment in question. So this, we're happy with this. We can divide both sides by two and we get one equals pi R times dr dt. This is the relationship that I'm looking for here, right? Kind of the important steps are these. We can add this in here. Since dA dt equals two, we get this. Dividing both sides by two, you get this. Now, I want dr dt when a is equal to five. To get that, I need to know what r is when a is equal to five. When a is equal to five, right, we have a is equal to pi r squared. This is always true for a circle. So when a is equal to five, we get five equals pi r squared, which means five over pi is equal to r squared. So r has to be the square root of five over pi. Now I can take this r value, right? The square goes all the way down here, the whole fraction of the square. Um, I can take this r value, plug it in here and solve for dr dt. Thus, at the moment, When a is equal to five, we have one equals pi times the square root of five over pi times dr dt. And this is an equation we can solve for dr dt. Let me continue this over here. That means one over pi is equal to the square root of five over pi times dr dt. And then I need to divide both sides by this thing. So this is going to be one over pi times the square root of pi over five, which is dr dt. And we could combine these if we wanted to, um, but I'd say you know we just leave it like this. So that's it. All right, this is our answer. Um, you can feed this to a calculator if you want. Uh, or you can combine it into a single fraction. We might as well. Um, so what is this? This I can treat this pi as the square root of pi squared. So this is the square root of pi over pi squared times five equals dr dt. And you can cancel one of the pi's. Um, so this is one over pi times five under my radical equals dr. Um, but you could stop it at this, uh, sorry, you could stop at this stage if you wanted. The big idea here is getting comfy differentiating with respect to time. So we start with a equals pi r squared, and we differentiate with respect to time. All right, we start with this. And we take the ddt derivative on both sides. 
that gets us this. And then we start plugging in the things we know. We know that dA dt is equal to two. And we clean that up a little bit and that gives me the relationship between r and dr dt. Since I want dr dt at the moment when a is equal to five, I have to find out what this piece is at the moment when a is equal to five. That's what we're solving for here. And then we plug that in. Having plugged that in, we can then solve for dr dt. This is a pretty classic example. Um, I'm dividing both sides by that fraction, right? So yeah, so this algebra here, let's say I got a little bit nervous at the end because I was worried I was gonna lose you guys in the algebra. How do you solve an equation like this? Well, I wanna get dr dt on its own. So I have to divide over by this. If you wanted to, if this, if writing it this way looks scary to you, it's acceptable to say, okay, this is, this is equivalent to saying one over pi divided by the square root of five over pi. And if you'd rather write it like that, it equals drdp. This is fine too. Um, I was just simplifying. When you divide by the square root of five over pi, that's the same as multiplying by the square root of pi over five. And then I combine the square roots. This is, this is how I would do it. But if the, that step kind of worries you, if you want to do it more gently, you can do it like this. Um, and then we're flipping and multiplying. So I've got my one over pi times the square root of pi over five equals dr dt. This, this was the stuff we had here. And then I can combine the two squares if you want to, but don't, don't worry about that. Um, if you if you want to write it like this, this is fine. Okay. So we can do I still have lab it up, I do. I can get a feel for this. Uh, if I take Use the form that's a little bit easier to work with here. This is one divided by the quantity pi times five root. This is about 0.252 or dr dt is approximately. 0 0.252, and this is going to be kilometers per day. So if the area is growing at one kilometer per day, or sorry, uh, two kilometers per day, two square kilometers per day, then the radius is growing at 0.25, or about one fourth of a kilometer per day, right? That's the idea. If the area of this circle is growing at two square kilometers per day, then the radius has to be growing at like 0 0.25 kilometers per day. It's just a connection between the radius and the area, right? That's all that's going on there. As the area grows, the radius grows. If the radius grows, the area grows. They told us how fast the area was growing, so we had to figure out how fast the radius was growing. Does that make sense? Let's try another one. Let's see here. Let grab something a little gentle. Yeah, that works. It's very, very similar to what we just did though. Oh yeah, this is a classic. Meters, 10 feet, You guys, you guys ever stood on top of a ladder and you feel the bottom start to slide out a little bit? Um, this is a feeling I worked in construction for a few years. I dropped out of high school and worked in construction until I was like 20. Um, this is a feeling that everybody who's experienced it knows. It's terrifying. 
um, because it means you're about to bust massive ass. You're about to hit the ground and it's gonna suck. Um, how fast do you fall as the bottom of the ladder slides out? So, a 10 foot ladder is resting on a wall. Um, the base begins to slide out. Let's see what are the actual stats they gave us at one foot per second. If so, the base is sliding out at one foot per second. If the base of the ladder is sliding out at one foot per second, how fast is the top of the ladder sliding down at the moment? When the base is six feet up from the wall, this is probably the most famous related rates problem in the world um, because it's it's relatively easy. Um, the geometry is nice and clear. The trick to this is to draw a picture, and the trick to pretty much all related rates problems is to draw a picture. Draw a picture and label everything nice and clearly. So here's your wall. Here's the floor. Here's the ladder. All right, there's a 10 foot ladder, the distance from here to here is 10 feet. This is the base of the ladder. This is the top of the ladder right here. This is the wall. So we know the base of the ladder is sliding out. And that means the top of the ladder is sliding down, right? As this comes out, this comes down. Let me call the distance from here to here, x. Um, and let's call the height of the ladder y. All right, not the height of the ladder, but the, the, plate, the height where the ladder hits the wall. All right, so we've got our diagram here. We need to think of, look about this problem and ask, what do we know? And what do we want? So all these problems go the same. You draw a diagram, and then you label the diagram with some variables. We know that the base of the ladder is sliding out, so I should let this distance be a variable because it's changing because the base slides out. And I know that the top of the ladder is going down as the base slides out. So I should let this distance be a variable. So anything that changes gets labeled with a variable. And then we come over here and we write down what we know and what we want. If the base of the ladder is sliding out at one foot per second, so what does that tell me? What thing do I know based on this sentence? The base of the ladder is sliding out at one foot per second. Okay, so the ladder is sliding out at one foot per second. What does that tell me? Good. 
good. Yep. Yeah, it means that this piece right here is moving out along the x-axis, but specifically, what derivative does that tell me about? Does that tell me about dy dt? Does it tell me about dx dt? Yeah, it's something to do with x. But what derivative information is that giving me? What do you mean by what derivative it's giving? Well, one foot per second, right? This is a rate of change. It's the rate of change of what variable? T. Um, yeah, it's x dt. The risk is correct. The x dt. If x is the distance from the base of the ladder to the wall, and the base of the ladder is sliding out at one foot per second, that means x is growing at one foot per second. In other words, dx dt must be one. Yeah, let me put that in black and then I'll like circle it in blue so you can see the connection. dx dt is equal to one. That's what that blue underlined sentence tells me. All right. Does everybody see how this sentence here tells me that dx dt is one? We have the choice to label this as x. If you label this distance here as some other variable, then it would be the derivative of that thing. If you called this L, then that would be dl dt equals one. But this distance right here is x. That's the distance from the base of the ladder to the wall. Since the base of the ladder is sliding out, x is getting bigger over time. How fast is x getting bigger? Well, x is getting bigger at one foot per second. That means the rate of change for the variable x is one foot per second. All right, this is the rate of change of x with respect to time. How fast is x changing over time? That's why this Leibniz notation is so nice. It, it's very evocative of what the thing describes. X is getting bigger at one foot per second. So dx over dt, the rate of change for x has to be one. What is it I want? Kind of thinking that same logic. If this thing sliding out tells me dx. Mm -hmm. Now you want to know when x is six? It's true. I want to know something at the moment when x is six. What is the thing I want to know? No, the, the y value when x is six. Is it the y value? Do Pardon. I want to know how tall is y? Yeah, the, the dy value. dt. Good. Yeah, dy dt. Perfect. Yep. I want to know how fast is, is this changing at that moment. So I want to know the derivative of y at the moment. when the base is six feet out from the wall. So that means at the moment when X is six. So imagine you're standing or sitting up here at the top of this ladder doing some work. You feel the base of the ladder start to slide out. What we're trying to find out is how fast are you falling at the moment when this ladder's ass is six feet out from the wall? That's what we're trying to sort out. How quickly is this thing going down at the moment when this distance right here is six feet. So now we've figured out the things we know. We have figured out the things we want. So what we need to do now is connect these two, right? I need to connect dx dt to dy dt so I can like plug this in and solve for this. What geometric relationship exists between x and y in this picture? Anybody see anything special about the geometry of this situation? It's a triangle. Yeah, what kind of triangle? Uh, 90 degree triangle. Yeah, it's a right triangle, which means? You can use a uh, sine, cosine, tangent. Uh, well, we could, yeah, that's true. Um, but the latter, 
floor and wall. There's an easier way though. Um, uh, sorry, the water floor and wall form a right triangle. I'm not really interested in any angles here, but I'm interested in the side lengths and the side lengths of a right triangle obey the Pythagorean, um, the Pythagorean formula. So the latter form wall from a right triangle. So x squared plus y squared has to be equal to 10 squared, right? a squared plus b squared equals c squared. The legs are x and y, right? x is this distance, y is this distance, and the length of the ladder is 10 feet. The length of the ladder is always the hypotenuse, right? Even as the ladder slides out, the length of the hypotenuse will always be 10. So now do you plug in six for x and then solve for y? Well, remember what I want. Yeah, I am going to need to do that. But what I really want here is dx dt and dy dt. All right, so you take the derivative first and then you plug in six. Good, yeah. So here I would say this is the same as x squared plus y squared equals 100. We call this one. And now we differentiate one with respect to time t. So we're going to take the time derivative everywhere here. We're going to take ddt of both sides. So I'll have ddt of x squared plus y squared equals ddt of 100. The time derivative ddt of x squared and y squared are 2x times dx dt and 2y times dy dt, just like we did in that very first little example. And the time derivative of the constant 100 is 0. x squared plus y squared equals 100 is just this. It's the Pythagorean formula for the, for the right triangle, right? Pythagorean theorem says a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Right? The sum of the squares of the side lengths of a right triangle is equal to the square of the hypotenuse. It's Pythagoras. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That's sort of the most fundamental thing we have in trigonometry. So because the ladder and these lengths make up a right triangle, I know this. 10 squared is 100. All right, I just squared 10 to get 100. Well, that's just true for any right triangle. Right, you take any right triangle in the world. This is A, B, and C, then A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That's always true. And since this is a right triangle, I can write this down. So now what I have to do is look back at what we know and what we want. We know that dx dt is one. So this piece right here is one. I want dy dt at the moment when x is six. So I get two x times one plus two y times dy dt equals zero. <laughs> now I can solve this for dy dt. This is the same as saying 2y times dy dt is equal to negative 2x. And then I can divide both sides by 2y, and I get that dy dt is equal to negative 2x divided by 2y. That's negative x over y. Everybody with me so far? 
how did you get rid of the DXDT on the left side on the second line? Uh, remember, DXDT is one. Let me know that DXDT is equal to one. So I just plugged in one for DXDT. Okay. And then I subtract this term over. And then I divide by 2y. And then if we want dy dt at the moment, then x is equal to 6. So I could plug in a 6 for x, but I don't yet know what y is. At the moment when x is 6, I'm not sure what y is. I need to calculate that. So this is just like in the previous problem where we had to go back and calculate r at the moment in question. Here we need to go back and calculate y at the moment in question. We arrive here and we're pretty happy. Now to finish the problem, I need to know what is y when x is equal to 6. We have x squared plus y squared equals 100. So when x is equal to 6, we have 36 plus y squared is equal to 100, which means that y squared it is 100 minus 36, which is 64. So y has to be the positive square root, which is 8. Therefore, at the moment, when x is equal to 6, we have dy dt equals negative x over y. So that's negative 6 over 8. Or uh, if you divide top and bottom by 2 here, you get negative 3 fourths. And that's the per second. Oops, okay. So these related rates problems, they're called, because they relate one rate of change to another rate of change. And given information about one rate of change, you can figure out the others. They're very important in physics. This step here, where you arrive at these time derivatives from the geometry thing, this is something physicists do all day long, um, or really any sort of place where you're applying calculus to the real world. These are your kind of foundational real world calculus problems. For anybody who wants to go into engineering or physics or any related fields, these things are your bread and butter. I'd like to take a second, take questions on this. Please, uh, I'll zoom out here a little bit. Is this thing frozen? Ah, oh, shit. Um, what does it say after y squared equals, does that say C4? 64. 64? Yeah, 100 minus 36. So I'm subtracting 30. Oh, OK. I didn't see that. Thank you. I thought it was a C. Thanks. Yeah, 64. All right, what else are we wondering?
if there are not other questions, let me take a look and see if we have some other kind of easy, intuitive ones. So here's the strategy, right? This is kind of what I was saying a second ago. Uh, read carefully, draw a diagram, assign symbols to anything that changes, right? Um, and then take derivatives. Um, and then you might have to go back and figure out any missing piece. Like here, we had to go back and find out what y was at the moment when x is 6. Um, you know, you get your derivatives. And then substitute everything in and solve. Uh, one of my favorite problems like this is a, a simple, like pure math problem um, are the best here. Ah, fuck it. Let's do that. That's easy. Yeah. What did I say at the moment when I'm when my area is 16. Right, I'm gonna do one more simple one here, and then uh, then I'll let you guys go for the day. This related rate stuff is going to take a lot of practice. You don't have to do this one time. But it's not too bad. Make sure you fully understand the chain rule and fully understand implicit differentiation before you work on the related rates problems. So if you haven't finished the previous homework on the chain rule, or if you kind of hacked it together, um, go back and really solve those problems. Then solve the related rates problems from this week, uh, sorry, then solve the implicit differentiation problems from this week's homework, then the related rates. Um, but let's try one more. Each side of a square is growing at three feet per second. How fast is the area of the square growing when the side lines are six feet. All right, so you imagine you've got a square here. We'll draw our diagram. It's a square, so all the side lengths are the same. I'll just call them x. All right, this is x. This is x. And these are both x as well. The square is growing, right? So these side lengths, this is growing, and this is growing. I want to know how fast is the area growing at the moment when both side length, when all the side lengths are six. So we want dA dt at the moment when x is equal to 6. And we know that dx dt is what? What is dx dt here? Three. Good, three, right? The side lengths are all x. We know the side lengths are going at three feet per second. OK. Now we have to have a relationship between x and a, right? What is the area of a square? Well, the area of a square is just the side length, like length times width, right? x squared. So now if I differentiate on both sides, I get dA dt equals 2x times dx dt. What I want is dA dt at the moment when x is equal to 6. And what I know is that dx dt is equal to 3. So this is dA dt equals 2x times 3. So dA dt at the moment when x is equal to 6, dA dt must be 2 times 6 times 3, uh, which is 12 times 3, which is 36. 
and that's square feet or feet squared per second. And that's it. So this is sort of your maximally simple related rates problem, right? And if you're looking, if you're, if you're feeling really lost on those other examples, this might be a good one to kind of run through on your own and make sure you fully understand what's going on. Did it just happen to come out 36, which is just six squared? Uh, yeah, the fact that this is a perfect square is a coincidence, yeah. All right, if I said the side was growing at, at one foot per second, then this would just be 12. And if I said the side was growing at seven feet per second, then this would be uh, 12 times seven. A number that I can't do in my head right now because I'm tired. But, <laughs> but this is the idea. So I know that related rate feels weird at first, especially if you're not 100% comfy with um, implicit differentiation. So take your time and get comfy with implicit differentiation. And um, where did A equals X squared come from? Well, the area of a square is the side length times the side length, right? Length times width, that's the area of a square. It's this times this. So this is the area. So if I want to find the area of any rectangle, I multiply like these side length. Since it's a square, both of these side lengths are x. So a has to be x times x or x squared. OK. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop here. Um, Please do take the time to solve the implicit differentiation problems in the homework. Um, those are a little bit tricky. Um, the other thing that's in your homework this week that I want to talk about is something called logarithmic differentiation. Um, so in service to that, uh, next time we will, we'll just solve a bunch of homework problems. And I'll take examples from all, all of the little bits. Uh, we can do some logarithmic differentiation. We can do some implicit differentiation. And we can do some related rates. What I'd like you guys to do between now and then is first get caught up on anything, right? If there's anything from before exam one, homework-wise, that you haven't done, please get caught up. Um, and then take a look at this week's homework, right? Make sure you solve at least one or two of the regular implicit differentiation problems. Don't wait for the weekend to do this. It'll make the lectures so much easier to understand if you kind of work along through the, through the homework um, or work along through the week on the homework. Um, but that's it. If you want to talk about anything else, you want to solve more problems together, come see me in office hours. Otherwise, you can get a hold of me by sending me a Canvas message. Um, I will see you guys next time. Uh, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, sure. Can we expect any curves on the test or no? No, no, no curve. All right. Take care, guys. Yeah. Or